What will heaven be like? Every Christian wonders about it at one point or another. And that's our topic today on Renewing Your Mind. Imagine spending eternity in a place you know nothing about. It sounds a bit strange, doesn't it? Yet many Christians know very little about heaven. And what they do know is influenced more by culture than by the Bible. Welcome to Renewing Your Mind with the founder and chairman of Ligonier Ministries, Dr. R.C. Sproul. Unfortunately, much of what the Bible says about heaven is wrapped in metaphor and obscurity. Is there anything, then, that we can know for sure about heaven? According to Dr. Sproul, the answer to that is yes. He's titled today's lesson, The Believer's Final Rest. Today we come to the end of our 60-unit series, our overview of Christian doctrine, and it's only appropriate that when we come to the end of our study of the things of God that we should be studying what happens to us at the end at the end of our lives. And the glorious hope that we as Christians have is that of entering into our rest in heaven. Every Sunday, we see God's sign of the promise of rest that is before every believer, as the Sabbath day is God's established sign of His promise that we will enter into our rest in the future. But there are those in our day who doubt that there's life after death and who say to us that our hope of heaven is just so much pie in the sky. It's a direct result of our ability to project our wishes and our desires into the future. And they will ask, on what basis do we have any real confidence that the next world will be better than this one? And, of course, our answer to that as Christians is from the testimony of Christ, not only by virtue of the proof of his own conquest over death by the resurrection from the grave, but also from his teaching. We remember his words at the home of Mary and Martha at the time that he visited Bethany when their brother had died before Jesus could get there, before Jesus would raise Lazarus from the dead. And we remember Jesus saying, I am the resurrection and the life. And though a man dies, yet shall he live. Now, in the upper room discourse on the night of his own betrayal, in John chapter 14, Jesus makes this observation. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Now, when Jesus begins this discourse that is so popular among Christians, he begins with a commandment. He begins with an imperative. When he says, let not, he is using the form of the language that implies an obligation. We are commanded not to have our hearts troubled about these matters, about our future in heaven. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, and I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. Now, here's Jesus the Last Supper, sitting there with his disciples, that they know that the crisis is upon them, that he is about to be removed from their midst. And they're concerned. They're anxious. And Jesus said, calm down. Don't let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, don't you? Well, believe also in me. Because in my Father's house are many mansions. Now, here's what he says. If it were not so, I would have told you. Now, this is the rabbi teaching the disciples, the master teaching his students. And he's saying before he leaves, I would not let you continue on in false hope, pie in the sky, 
wish fulfillment and psychological cripples in this regard. If this were a false hope, if this were simply a projected paradise, I would have corrected your error. If it were not so, I would have told you. But not only is it so, but that's exactly where I'm going right now. I'm going to my father's house, and I'm going there with the, one of the purposes I'm going for is to prepare a place for you. I'm going ahead into heaven and make sure that when I get there, there will be a place for you when you die. And that's the promise of Christ to his people, that everyone who puts his trust in him, Christ has prepared a place in his Father's house for us. And God doesn't make idle preparations. And I think we've all had the experience of preparing dinner for guests, and then at the last minute we get the phone call that's saying that they've been sidetracked and they're not able to make the appointment. Well, it doesn't happen when Christ prepares a place for his people. His people will make use of that place. And so the first thing we want to say about heaven is that we have every reason to be confident of its reality. But usually where our concern is about heaven is what's it going to be like? And the scriptures have much to say about heaven. But John also, in his first epistle, gives some insight into our future state, which I think is extremely important to us. In chapter 3 of 1 John, we read these words. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God. Now, we've looked at this from another perspective elsewhere. Therefore, the world doesn't know us, because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are the children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. This text, I think, is one of the most important eschatological texts, if not the most important eschatological text in all of the New Testament, because what it promises the believer is the zenith of the felicity that we will enjoy in heaven, which is found in what is called technically in theology the visio dei or the beatific vision. The first phrase, visio Dei, simply means the vision of God. Which vision is called the beatific vision? Why? Well, you may not be familiar with the term beatific, but you are familiar with the term beatitude. The beatitudes are those sayings that are recorded in the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus begins each of the beatitudes with the prophetic oracle of blessing. Blessed are the poor. Blessed are the peacemakers and those who hunger and thirst after righteousness and so on. That is a promise of blessedness, a degree of happiness that transcends any pleasure or any kind of earthly happiness when God gives blessedness to the soul of a person. That is the supreme level of joy and fulfillment and of happiness that any creature can ever receive. And that is called, this blessedness is what is in view here when we talk about the beatific vision. A vision that is so wonderful, a vision that is so fulfilling, that the vision itself brings with it the fullness of the blessing. And what is that vision? It's the vision of God. For what John says here in this chapter is we don't know yet what we're going to be. He said, I don't know all the details of what heaven is going to be like. But one thing we know is that we will be like him, for we shall see him in, say, est, in the Vulgate, in the Latin version. We will see him as he is in himself. We're going to be able to see and to behold not a theophany, not an indirect manifestation of God, not a burning bush, 
not a pillar of cloud or a pillar of smoke, but we're going to see him as he is. We're going to see him in his unveiled being. Now, wait a minute. In the Old Testament, all of the joys and blessings that people experience by the nearness of God have a limit. And the limit is this, no man shall see God. No man is allowed to see the face of God or they will perish. Even Moses, who begged with the Lord that the Lord would let him see his face, God said, no, Moses, I'll let you get a backward glimpse of my passing glory, but my face shall not be seen. That kind of intimate vision, face-to-face, looking directly at God, is what is absolutely forbidden every mortal in this world. And it's what makes the living of the Christian life so difficult because you are called to pursue a life of obedience and holiness and devotion and dedication to a God you've never seen. That's the hardest thing of the Christian life is that we serve a master who is invisible to us. Never heard his voice, never seen him, and yet the promise is that someday we will see him. Well, the immediate question that comes up at this point theologically is, now wait a minute, how are we going to see God as he is when God is invisible? And yet we go back to the Sermon on the Mount, who is it that is promised that they would see God? It's not the peacemakers, it's not the poor, it's not the merciful, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And you see, the reason why we can't see God is not because there's something wrong with our eyes. The reason why we can't see God is there's something wrong with our hearts. But when we enter into glory and receive the fullness of our sanctification, that present barrier that makes this impossible to have a direct and immediate perception of God will be removed. But again, you say, but it's still, even in heaven, God will not have a body. He will be a spirit. How can you see a spirit? Well, I don't know the answer to that. This is one of those things where God has not told us, although some of the best minds in theology have speculated on it a little bit. Just yesterday I was writing, I'm working on a book on philosophy and was dealing with one of the philosophers and explaining the whole business of mediated knowledge. And in my illustration, I talked about watching basketball games on television. And we say that when I watch the basketball game on television, am I really watching the basketball game? Obviously, I'm not live and present at the event. The basketball game is taking place miles away from where I am. What I am watching is an electronic broadcast and reproduction of what is taking place miles and miles and miles away. There is a medium between the game and me. And so I am made aware of what's going on at the basketball game through the media. What is a media? but an intermediary that communicates something that's going on over here to someone who is over here. Now, why do I say that? I said, well, I didn't see the game. I was only looking at pictures of the game. Well, if I were at the game, what would I be looking at? Images that are reflected in front of my eyes, and light then illumines that image so that light sources hit my eyes and the lens of my eyes, my optic nerve, and through this whole process of sight, I say, ah, I see it. But all kinds of things are taking place here in the transmission of the sensory activity that I am perceiving with my eyes. And I couldn't see anything. If I had the best vision in the world and you locked me in a room without any light, I wouldn't see anything. I still need light. And I need those images to be able to see them. So even our present sight is mediated. And what Edward said was this, that we are going to be in such a state where our souls, without the advantage of our eyes, will be able to have a direct 
an immediate apprehension of the invisible God. Now, again, soul, spirit-to-spirit communication. I don't know how that works. That's pure speculation. But one thing we know for certain through the revealed Word of God is that the delight of our souls in heaven will be that we will see Him. And we will see Him as He is. Now, in our series on the overview of the Bible, Dust of Glory, where we went through from the beginnings of Genesis and gave an overview of the whole scope of biblical history and revelation, ending up in the book of Revelation, we titled that series, Dust to Glory. Obviously, the glory was found in the zenith of Revelation that comes to us in the last couple of chapters of the New Testament in the book of Revelation, where John records the vision that he received on the island of Patmos in which Christ himself showed him things, including a vision at the end of the apocalypse of the new heaven and of the new earth that come down from God. And let's just take a moment to look at some of these elements. Chapter 21 of the book of Revelation. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And there was no more sea. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God will be with them, and he will be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying, no more pain. For the former things will have passed away. Now, notice that when the Bible gives us a description of the coming of heaven, it focuses on some startling dimensions of what heaven will be like and what it will not be like. It tells us what will be there, what will not be there. If you go on and read this text, it does talk about streets of gold. Gold so fine and so pure that it is translucent. It talks about gates constructed with magnificent pearls and the foundation established and adorned with precious jewels. Now, knowing the nature of apocalyptic literature, what is so imaginative, we assume that these are symbolic representations about what heaven will be like. But let me just say, I wouldn't put it past him. I would not put it past God to have a city that is paved with streets of gold and to have it look just exactly as it is described right here. Wouldn't put it past him at all. But he said, there's no sea there. I saw, oh, wait a minute. And that's what we live for every year is to go on vacation, go to the beach. We love the sea. No, no, no. For the Hebrew, the sea is the symbol of violence. They didn't have sandy beaches in Israel. Their seacoast was the source of marauders coming who attacked them and violent weather that came off the Mediterranean. In all of Hebrew poetry, the sea is a negative symbol. It's the river, it's the fountain, it's the well that serves as the positive image in the Hebrew poetry, not the sea. And so he says, the first thing, folks, there won't be any violent natural catastrophes that you have to worry about in heaven because the sea won't be there. And he said, here's what else won't be. There won't be any tears. There's no room for tears unless they're tears of joy. But we associate tears in our language with sorrow, with sadness, with grief. And every child remembers what it was like to be overwhelmed with being upset and having a fit of crying and having your mother come with her apron and wiping away the tears. And what a comforting thing that is. However, you cry again tomorrow. But when God wipes away your tears, they never come back. They will be no more. Why? Because the things that make us cry will be removed. There will be no more death. There will be no more sorrow. There will be no more pain. 
these former things will have passed away. Well, we jump down to verse 22 and we find out what else won't be in heaven. There'll be no temple there. And we go on and we see, oops, there'll be no sun there. There'll be no moon there. No temple? You mean there'll be no church? And there'll be no sun, no moon? What is this place of desolation? Thought it was going to be heaven. Why won't there be a temple there? Because the temple is the visible symbol of the presence of God. And when the reality is there, you don't need the physical temple there. And why will there not be any sun or moon or stars? These are artificial sources of light. And what we're told about that in heaven, the radiance, the refulgence of the glory of God and of the Lamb will illumine the whole city. There will never be night because the glowing, brilliant, radiant glory of God never stops. It's not on a 24-hour cycle. I mean, the sun of righteousness does not set ever. So heaven will be a place that will be aglow with the unvarnished, unveiled radiance of God. And there are other beautiful things that are said here about heaven. But think of it, friends. What are you living for? Jonathan Edwards said, you know, Can you imagine somebody saving to go on a journey on a vacation for 10 years? And in order to get to their destination, they had to travel. And at the first night, they stopped at a wayside inn. And the next day, instead of continuing their travel to get to their desired destination that they had hoped and saved for for all this time, they decided to forego it all and to stay in the inn. That's the way we are. We hold on so tenaciously to life in this world because we haven't really been convinced of the glory that the Father has established in heaven for his people. But for all eternity, God has established this place, which is the end and the destiny of all of his people. It doesn't get any better than that. And again, every aspiration, every hope, every joy that we look forward to will be there and then some in this wonderful place. Our greatest moment will be the moment that we walk through the door and leave this world of tears and of sorrow, this valley of death, and enter into the presence of the Lamb. Dr. R.C. Sproul with a message titled, The Believer's Final Rest. You're listening to Renewing Your Mind, the radio outreach of Ligonier Ministries. We'll hear from Dr. Sproul again in just a moment. Fittingly, today's lesson marks the conclusion of our more than year-long series titled Foundations, an Overview of Systematic Theology. If you've stuck with us through this entire study, you know just how impressive the scope of it has been. We've covered everything from the doctrine of God to the nature of humanity to the Gospels and even angels and demons. This truly is the most comprehensive of all our series at Ligonier Ministries. And this is the last day of our study. It also marks the last day you can request the special offer on DVD. This overview of systematic theology is available when you give a donation of any amount. The resource set also includes a printable study guide for each lesson and a CD-ROM containing all of the audio files as well. No matter if you've heard one or all of these messages, you'll benefit from owning the complete teachings from Dr. Sproul. But again, this is your last chance to give a donation and make your request for this unprecedented special offer. Call 1-800-435-4343 or online you can go to rymoffer.com. You'll be pleased to know that the printable study guide for the Foundation Series includes a bibliography for each study. If there's a particular topic you'd like to pursue further, Reference Dr. Sproul's list of related resources on each lesson. These recommended resources are both in-depth and accessible. Request the series on DVD right now before the offer expires. Mention the title, Foundations, an Overview of Systematic Theology, when you call 1-800-435-4343 
or online at rymoffer.com. Well, next week, we'll begin a new study on the topic of apologetics. Here's Dr. Sproul with a look ahead. The science of apologetics is devoted to providing an intellectual defense for the truth claims of the Christian faith. And we like to say at Ligonier that one of our tasks is to help people know what they believe and why they believe it. And so the case that is presented for a particular truth claim, the evidence or the reason that is advanced why we should believe this rather than that, is what the task of apologetics is about. I'm Lee Webb. Learn to defend your faith with accuracy and clarity. Join us again seven days from now for the start of a new series on apologetics. Listen next weekend to Renewing Your Mind.